Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. When I was working on our episode on the Women's March to Pretoria, South Africa, not long ago, I kept finding references to Emily Hobhouse. Emily Hobhouse was a pacifist and a humanitarian. She's best known for her work exposing terrible conditions at concentration camps that Britain established in South Africa during the Anglo-Boer War and trying to help the people who were being held in those camps who were predominantly Boers. At the time, a lot of people in Britain saw her as a traitor because in their mind, she was trying to help the enemy Although, to be clear, the vast majority of people she was trying to help here were civilian women and children. Uh, Her work continued into and after World War I, and she became a very vocal pacifist and tried to arrange relief efforts for children in continental Europe after World War I. Although the perceptions of Emily Hobhouse eventually shifted at least somewhat in the UK, she's still far better known in South Africa, and her work there had some complexities. There's a complicated legacy with it today. So this episode grew into an accidental two-parter. Today, we will be talking about Hobhouse's earlier life up through the Boer War, which you'll also hear with other slightly different pronunciations that also vary with people's accents, just as a note. Uh, In part two of this episode, we'll be talking about the years after that war and then up through and after World War I. So Emily Hobhouse was born April 9th, 1860, in St. Eve in eastern Cornwall. St. Eve is not to be confused with St. Ives, which is in western Cornwall on the coast. Her father was Reginald Hobhouse, Anglican priest and archdeacon of Bodmin. Her mother, Caroline Trelawney, was the daughter of a baronet. Although slavery and the slave trade had been abolished in the UK before Emily was born, Some of the family's money had been earned through the slave trade in earlier generations. That was something Emily knew about when she was growing up. Emily had five surviving siblings. They were Caroline, known as Carrie, Blanche, Maud, Alfred, and Leonard. And as was common at the time, the girls had a separate education from the boys. Emily's brothers went to prestigious schools, and Leonard in particular made a name for himself at Oxford. But Emily and her sisters had governesses and then finishing schools, and that was focused mainly on how to keep a household and be a good wife. Hobhouse later said, quote, I envied the boys the special tutors they had, people whose brains they had the right to pick, of whom they might ask questions. I never had anyone to cut my mental teeth upon. In addition to her dissatisfaction with her education, Emily experienced a series of tragedies beginning when she was 16. Her sister Blanche developed an illness, probably tuberculosis, and the family went to Toulouse, France, with the hope that the climate there would help her recover. But it did not. She died in 1876 at the age of 19. This trip had drained the family's financial resources, and once they got back to Cornwall, there wasn't enough money to send Emily back to finishing school, She really hadn't been satisfied with her education there, but once she was stuck at home, her relationship with her father became increasingly contentious. She was growing into her own person with her own thoughts and opinions, and they were often in conflict with his. So, for example, she did a lot of work in their community. She would visit the poor and the sick, and that included people whose beliefs who didn't strictly conform to the Anglican church— Her father thought religious dissidents should be shunned, but she kept visiting them nonetheless. Emily's mother died of a brain tumor in 1880, when Emily was 20. By that point, Emily's sister Carrie was married, and their brothers were away. Leonard was at Oxford, and Alfred had moved to New Zealand. So that meant it was up to Emily and Maud to look after their aging father. Maud got married in 1889 to a man who wasn't seen as the best match for her, leading to some speculation that she was mostly just trying to get out of the house. That left Emily, who was the youngest Hobhouse daughter, in the role of both housekeeper and caregiver to her father. She wanted to get married and to have children, and she did have some suitors, but her father was opposed to the idea of her marrying. He, of course, knew that if she got married, she would not have as much time or attention for him. While they had servants to take care of some of that day-to-day work, she found her life at home really difficult and confining. 
Her major outlet continued to be working in the community, so teaching Sunday school and establishing a library, trying to help poor people with everything from getting them food and clothes to testifying on their behalf in court. Reginald Hobhouse died in 1895, a few months before Emily's 35th birthday. Within weeks, she took her inheritance of 5,300 pounds sterling and left St. Eve. She spent time in London with relatives, but after six years living at the rectory with her father, she really just wanted to find something else to do with her life, something with both adventure and meaning. She knew that mine workers from Cornwall had immigrated to the United States and that conditions in the mining camps could be difficult. So in the summer of 1895, she left Cornwall for Minnesota. She wound up in the mining town of Virginia, Minnesota, where it turned out there weren't that many mine workers who were actually from Cornwall. The mining industry there wasn't particularly stable, so mines tended to close or change hands pretty often, and most of the Cornish miners who had immigrated there had also moved on when their mines had closed. Immigrants from other areas had moved in when new mines opened up, so Hobhouse stayed on, even though that wasn't Her original plan was to work with people from Cornwall, and she was working with a different group. She worked on a variety of social programs. She established a library. She taught people to read. She discovered that the hospital had a dentist, but not a doctor, so she did what she could to help care for patients. She taught Sunday school, and she went out to the mining camps to preach to the workers, which displeased Episcopal minister James McGonigal, who thought that that was not appropriate for a woman to do. She had other disputes with church leaders as well, like the mine workers' day off was Sunday, so she thought the library should be open on Sunday so they could use it. But a lot of the local clergy thought that the library should be closed on Sunday, obviously, because it was Sunday. Although the mine workers seemed to have generally appreciated Hobhouse's help, not all of her efforts were successful. She tried to start a temperance program, and while some of the miners signed temperance pledges, saloons were everywhere, and a lot of people just wanted it to stay that way. While living in Minnesota, Emily Hobhouse fell in love with John Carr Jackson. They had met previously when they'd been staying in the same boarding house, and since then, he had started a business. He'd also been elected mayor of Virginia and was talking about running for Congress. Eventually, they became engaged, and they decided to move to Mexico. Their plan was for Emily to travel to Mexico first, and then John would join later. He was having some financial difficulties, and he needed to get his money in order. When Emily got to Mexico, she bought a farm, one that grew things like coffee, bananas, and vanilla. And she had a house built where she and John would live. It was in a remote location, so she bought this property without seeing it, and she never visited it. She spent part of 1896 waiting for John to join her. But back in the United States, John's businesses completely collapsed. He and Emily kept making plans to reunite, and she kept her wedding dress with her as each of them traveled. Their plans kept falling through, though. They did see each other again, at least once. She went to England to visit family in 1897, and he met up with her there. They never got married, though. In the end, Emily lost the farm, as well as the money that she had spent securing a government contract for John to provide meat to Mexico City. And her relationship with John eventually ended. It's not totally clear why they never married, but it seems like he was financially incompetent at best, and at worst, trying to take advantage of her financially. By 1899, Hobhouse was back in London, staying with her aunt and uncle, Lord Arthur and Lady Mary Hobhouse. She was very close to both of them, and in a lot of ways, they were like parents to her. She kept doing work in the community, really focusing on at-risk women and children. In 1900, she published an article in the economic journal that was titled Dust Women. It was about women who physically sorted household garbage, They got paid 10 to 15 shillings a week. They were called dust women because this work was so dirty and dusty. More communities were starting to use things like incinerators to deal with their garbage, and social reformers were arguing that this garbage sorting was not a healthy job for women to do. They were arguing that this work should be abolished. So Hophouse documented the workers' pay and working conditions, how those conditions could be improved, and whether the women actually had other options for work if this job went away. In 
This had some common themes to her work in South Africa during the Second Anglo-Boer War, which we are going to get to after a sponsor break. We talked a bit about the development of the British and Dutch presence in what's now South Africa in that recent episode on the Women's March to Pretoria, and it's relevant here as well. So to briefly recap, Britain and the Netherlands established forts and colonies in parts of South Africa starting in the 17th century. And then Britain took control of the region during the Napoleonic Wars. There were immediate tensions between the British and the Boers. That's a term that comes from a Dutch word for farmer, but had come to describe people who were living in South Africa and had Dutch, German, or Huguenot ancestry. As more British people arrived in South Africa and British officials increased their control over the region, many Boers started moving north and east in what came to be known as the Great Trek. This migration peaked between 1835 and 1841, but it continued into the 1850s. This wasn't simply a move north to establish new settlements and get away from British control. There were multiple, incredibly violent conflicts with the local peoples and kingdoms, including the Zulu and the Ndebele. The Boers established what came to be known as the Boer Republics, and these coalesced into the South African Republic, also called the Transvaal, and the Orange Free State. These were initially independent and self-governing, but Britain continued to expand its presence farther into South Africa. And then when diamonds were discovered in the Transvaal, Britain unsurprisingly annexed it. All this fed into the First Boer War, which was also called the First War of Independence or the First Transvaal War of Independence from that perspective. That started in 1880. This war ended in a Boer victory in 1881 the South African Republic was designated as a British suzerainty, with Britain in charge of things like international affairs and relationships with the local African nations and kingdoms. But beyond that, the Republic was self-governing. This did not put an end to the tensions between the British and the Boer Republics, though, especially after gold was discovered in the Transvaal in 1886. This time, Britain didn't directly annex this territory, but a lot of newcomers started flocking to the area, and that led to disputes between the Boers and Eightlanders, or foreigners, most of whom were British. Tensions escalated between these groups of people and between the Boer leadership of the republics and British officials. It was like a local and more colonial-slash-national level that was disputes were going on. A peace conference held in the Orange Free State capital of Bloemfontein in May and June of 1899 was unsuccessful at resolving all of this. And the Second Boer War, also called the Second Anglo-Boer War, the South African War, or the Second War of Independence, started in October of 1899. Wars are, of course, incredibly complex, so this was just a sketchy overview. For the first few months of this war, things in South Africa progressed through pretty conventional fighting. A string of Boer victories in December of 1899 was nicknamed Black Week in the British press. This sparked a huge wave of enlistments into the military as people in the British Empire wanted to turn the tide of the war. In February of 1900, British Field Marshal Lord Frederick Roberts arrived in South Africa with reinforcements. Over the course of the war, troops from all over the British Empire served in South Africa, including from Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. India was also British territory, and Indians living in South Africa established the Natal Volunteer Ambulance Corps that was founded by Mohandas Gandhi. They formed that to act as stretcher bearers for the British troops. Soon, British forces in South Africa vastly outnumbered the Boer fighting force. Over the course of the war, there were more than 500,000 men on the British side and only about 45,000 for the Boers. Each side also recruited people from the local African population or pressed them into service, although those numbers are, as you can imagine, not as clear. On March 13th, the newly bolstered British forces occupied Bloemfontein, and two days later, Lord Roberts announced that any Boers who stopped fighting and signed a loyalty oath would be free to return to their farms. More than 10,000 people did so, and the British classified them as protected burghers. They were also known as hands-uppers. 
In May, Britain annexed the Orange Free State, renaming it Orange River Colony. Then in June, Britain occupied the Transvaal capital of Pretoria. Understandably, after occupying both of these capital cities and annexing the Orange Free State, Britain thought it had essentially won the war. But soon, Boer forces started a campaign of guerrilla warfare, including attacking railroad and telegraph lines. On June 16th, Lord Roberts announced what came to be known as a scorched earth policy. So if railroads or telegraph lines were attacked, British forces would burn nearby farms in retaliation. The last major Boer force was defeated in August of 1900. And by September, Britain had annexed the Transvaal. But guerrilla warfare was still ongoing. In November, Lord Roberts resigned due to illness, and he was replaced by Herbert Kitchener, first Earl Kitchener, who escalated Roberts' scorched earth policy. This included indiscriminately burning farms and homes and killing and seizing livestock, even when there had been no attacks on the infrastructure to purportedly justify it. This scorched earth policy meant that there were a lot of Boer civilians who suddenly had nowhere to live. Most of them were women and children. Britain had already established refugee camps to house people who had fled from their homes because of the fighting or who had surrendered and couldn't return to their farms. And at this point, they became concentration camps where Boer families were taken by force, sometimes because their farm had been burned, sometimes under the idea that the men in their lives might lay down their arms if they knew their families were in one of these camps. On December 20th of 1900, Kitchener also instituted a policy that Boers who surrendered would be placed in camps along with these families. When Emily Hobhouse traveled to South Africa during the Boer War, it was to investigate conditions in these camps and to deliver aid to the people in them. Getting to that part of the story, though, requires us to rewind a bit to what she was doing from the beginning of the war. Yeah, I initially tried to just tell those stories in tandem, and I felt like it was confusing in an audio (laughs) format. (laughs) So to go back to the start of the war from Emily's perspective, shortly after the war started, people in Britain who were opposed to it established the South African Conciliation Committee. And its purpose was to try to find some kind of peaceful resolution to the conflicts between the British and the Boers. Emily Hobhouse was involved from this from the beginning and was named the committee's secretary. Hobhouse thought women had a crucial role to play in the anti-war movement. She started organizing anti-war activity out of her flat, including helping the committee plan a mass meeting to be held at Queen's Hall in London on June 13, 1900. Thousands of women attended the meeting, and they passed a set of four resolutions condemning the war, protesting attempts to silent criticisms of government policy, protesting, quote, against any settlement which involves the extinction by force of two republics whose inhabitants, allied to us by blood and religion, cling as passionately to their separate nationality and flag as we do ours, and expressing sympathy with the women of Transvaal and the Orange Free State. This last resolution asked these women to remember that thousands of English women, quote, are filled with profound sorrow at the thought of their suffering and with deep regret of the action of their own government. Because of this work and her vocal opposition to the war, Emily Hobhouse was harassed and criticized. Friends who supported the war started cutting ties with her, and as she found herself cut off from a lot of her usual social circle, she decided there was really nothing stopping her from going to South Africa herself to investigate what was going on and to deliver supplies and relief. Virtually all of her family and friends that she was still on speaking terms with uh, tried to talk her out of it. But Hobhouse established the South Africa Women and Children Distress Fund to raise money for things like food and clothing. She also started studying Boer Dutch, which was what people called the language that would develop into Afrikaans. She also practiced the language with other passengers who spoke it as she traveled to South Africa by ship. She arrived there in late December of 1900. While Hobhouse was on the way to South Africa, Lord Kitchener issued another order, which separated the Boer women who were placed in these camps into two groups. The wives and families of burghers who had surrendered were classified as refugees, and the women whose husbands or other male family members were still fighting were undesirables. 
refugees were supposed to get preferential treatment in pretty much everything. So, for example, according to notebooks that Hobhouse kept while she was in South Africa, undesirables got smaller amounts of various rations. Like, they received one pound of meat twice a week, while refugees got three quarters of a pound of meat every day. We're going to get into Hobhouse's time in South Africa during the war after a pause for a sponsor break. When Emily Hobhouse arrived in Cape Colony in December of 1900, her plan was to buy and distribute relief supplies. She had brought some letters of introduction with her, but she was worried about whether she was actually up to the kind of work she was about to do. She had done, you know, community work. She'd taken that trip to Minnesota, but at this point, she was a single 40-year-old woman in a foreign country who was going to have to convince military leaders to give her access to concentration camps in a region that was at war. She also knew that this was going to be hard work, both emotionally and physically. She had a heart condition that affected her for most of her life. She started buying clothing and food to take to the camps, but quickly realized that everything was more expensive than it had been at home. The money that she had raised through the South Africa Women and Children Distress Fund did not go nearly as far as she wanted. But even so, when she wrote to her brother about it, she said she had six tons each of clothing and food. She sounded disappointed in this, not pleased, since the amount only filled about half a train car. Hobhouse negotiated with various military officials to try to get permission to visit the camps. And she finally got a telegram from Lord Kitchener that granted permission to do it, but only to go as far north as Bloemfontein, preferably without taking a Boer woman with her. This is a disappointment to her, both because there were camps north of Bloemfontein that she wanted to go to, and also because she had planned to travel with a Boer woman to interpret in case she turned out to need that. Also, just to have company. (laughs) Uh, Hobhouse carried this telegram with her in case she ran into any problems, and then she went to Bloemfontein on a troop train on January 24th. Conditions at the camp for Boers in Bloemfontein were terrible. When she got there, it housed about 2,000 women, 900 children, and a few men who had surrendered. There weren't enough candles, so the few that the camp did have were saved to provide some light for people who were caring for the seriously ill. The tents were tremendously overcrowded, and if a person died, their body just lay there in the tent until it could be buried. This was demoralizing and dehumanizing, and it also caused huge problems with flies and odors, especially because this was the summer. There was a herd of cows, but they were so underfed that they were barely producing any milk for the camp. There wasn't enough fuel to cook or to boil water, and two buckets of water hauled from a river was supposed to last eight people throughout an entire day. With that water, which was, again from a river, not very clean. That was supposed to be used for everything, cooking and cleaning and hygiene. And then in terms of hygiene, there was no soap. Combined with a lack of clean water and the serious overcrowding, this meant diseases spread really quickly. Regarding that lack of soap, Hobhouse wrote, quote, this seems to have been due to a careless order from headquarters with regards to the rations. And men don't think of these things unless it is suggested to them. They simply say how dirty these people are. As a side note, at various points in her writing, Hobhouse makes pretty broad descriptions about the men she's dealing with who are making all these decisions. At one point, she wrote about how the military just had no plan for clothing the people who were in the camps, many of whom had arrived at the camps with nothing because that same military had also burned down their homes. She wrote, quote, crass male ignorance, stupidity, helplessness, and muddling. I rub as much salt into the sore places of their minds as I possibly can because it is so good for them, but I can't help but melting a little when they are very humble and confess that the whole thing is a grievous and gigantic blunder and presents an almost insoluble problem, and they don't know how to face it. I feel like that could be applied to a lot of people in a lot of situations. Um, 
Hobhouse talked to the women and children at this camp and recorded their stories as she studied the conditions there. She also distributed food and clothing. And she did other things that she just thought needed to be done. Like on her first day, a snake, sometimes described specifically as a puff adder, crawled into a tent where she was talking with some women and children, and everyone else fled. She killed the snake with her parasol because she, quote, could not bear to think the thing should be at large in a community mostly sleeping on the ground. Uh, There's more than one story from her life about Emily Hobhouse killing a snake with her parasol as everybody else screamed and ran away. (laughs) (laughs) Hobhouse also visited other Boer camps, including ones farther north than Bloemfontein, and it's not totally clear how or whether she got permission to do that, contrary to what Lord Kitchener had told her she could do. At some of these camps, the conditions weren't quite as dire, like they weren't as overcrowded, and maybe they had water that was piped in from a spring instead of being hauled from a river in buckets. But at others, it was worse, like tents that weren't just overcrowded, they were also leaky, or food that wasn't just in short supply, but was also infested with maggots. Sometimes she also returned to a camp that she had already visited to find that the conditions had deteriorated while she was away, with the situation becoming even dirtier and more overcrowded. She also saw people who were in desperate need and weren't in a camp, like a group of about 600 women and children that she saw stranded at a train station who were still there when she passed back through roughly 10 days later. Hobhouse spoke very stridently to officers in charge about the conditions at these camps, which were not just unpleasant, they were deadly. Illnesses like typhoid and measles were just rampant. At one point, an officer in Kimberley refused to let her go back to Bloemfontein, telling her she could go to a town that was outside of the former Boer Republics or she could go back to Cape Town, like, not interested in letting her go back to somewhere she might keep causing trouble. So she wound up going back to Cape Town, used that opportunity to get more supplies before returning back to the Boer camps again. Something that she did not do was to investigate or visit what were known as native camps, native being a term used to describe Black people in South Africa. There were some Black people in the Boer camps, mostly household servants that Boers had brought with them, but there were also separate camps for Black people who had been displaced through the war and that scorched earth policy, whether the farm they had been working on had been destroyed or for some other reason. Most Black people were transported to or arrived in these camps in mid-1901 or later. Overall, there's been way less research into these camps than into the camps for Boers, and most of that research has been done only in more recent years. But in general, these camps had even fewer resources and less organization and worse conditions than the Boer camps did. There were also more men at these camps than at the Boer camps since they tended to include farm workers, and in some cases, entire villages that had been captured or displaced. Hobhouse knew these other camps existed, and she thought they probably also needed help. She tried to get other organizations to send representatives to South Africa to do their own investigation, organizations that she thought might already have an interest in the welfare of the Black population, like the Quakers and the Aborigines Protection Society. That was an international organization focused on the rights and welfare of indigenous and aboriginal peoples throughout the British Empire. Her report, back to the South Africa Women and Children Distress Fund, also contained multiple references to the native camps and their need for help, at one point saying, quote, I understand the death rate in the one at Bloemfontein to be very high, and so also in other places, but I cannot possibly pay any attention to them myself. This report doesn't say why she could not possibly pay attention to them herself. One possible reason is that she had raised this money specifically to help Boer women and children, and she didn't think she could use it for another purpose. Although some of the people in these so-called native camps may have spoken some Boer Dutch, most of them were more likely to speak a Bantu language, which Hobhouse didn't speak and also wouldn't have had as many resources for learning. Another possibility is that she thought focusing her attention and resources on Black people might alienate the Boer women whose trust she was trying to gain or that they might find it antagonizing or that the people whose financial support she was relying on to do this work might see it that way. 
Although Hobhouse's own values included racial equality, if this was her rationale, she was basically appeasing racists. Whatever her exact reasoning or how she felt about it, this decision had multiple long-term effects. One was that the concentration camps for Black people did not get nearly the attention that the ones for Boers did, not in terms of relief during the war and not in terms of documentation and historical focus later on. Over the course of the war, there were at least 50 camps for Boers and at least 64 for Black Africans. And in total, about 285,000 people were held at these two sets of camps. About 55,000 of them died. About 30,000 of them were white, and about 25,000 of them were Black. Most of these deaths were among children, and most of them were due to disease. For comparison, there were a little more than 21,000 deaths among British soldiers during the war, two-thirds of those from disease and just under 10,000 military deaths among the Boers. Both the British and the Boers recruited Black people to do everything from manual labor to active combat, including forcing some of them into service. Their death toll is not clear, but even with that in mind, more people died in these camps than were killed in combat during the Second Anglo-Boer War. Emily Hobhouse advocated for changes and improvements at the Boer camps while she was in South Africa. Things like getting a train boiler and using that to boil the water for the whole camp. Assigning a matron to each camp who spoke both English and Boer Dutch. Establishing schools for the children. Reducing overcrowding and providing more food, water, and soap. But a lot of the time, officials just dismissed her. Eventually, she felt like she had done everything she could in South Africa, and that to get to the root of this problem, she would have to go back to England to talk to government and military leaders there and to publish uncensored accounts of what she had seen. People in Britain were at least somewhat aware of what was happening in South Africa. Although a lot of correspondence out of South Africa had been censored, newspapers had reported on the scorched earth policy. It had not caused a lot of outcry in Britain, though. Some people thought it was justified since British troops sometimes found weapons on Boer farms, and some Boers who signed loyalty oaths ultimately resumed fighting. But by early 1901, word was starting to spread about how dire the situation was. On February 18th, Liberal MP David Lloyd George gave a speech before the House of Commons in which he quoted a Lieutenant Morrison as saying, quote, the country is like Scotland and we move from valley to valley, lifting cattle and sheep, burning and looting, and turning out women and children who weep in despair beside the ruin of their once beautiful homes. It was the first touch of Kitchener's iron hand and often a terrible thing to witness, and I do not know that I want to see another trip of this sort. Emily Hobhouse arrived back in England a little over three months after that, on May 24, 1901. In June, she issued her report of a visit to the camps of women and children in the Cape and Orange River colonies. This report detailed what she had observed in the camps and her recommendations that someone be tasked with doing something similar for the camps for Black people. Although the people Hobhouse was talking about were civilians, almost all of them women and children, she was branded as pro-Boer. People called her hysterical and biased. She tried to arrange meetings and public addresses to tell people more about what she had found, but again and again, venues canceled her bookings or local authorities refused to give her permission to speak. When she did manage to put together a speaking tour, she was harassed, including people throwing vegetables at her. At the same time, though, the government also faced increasing criticism about what she reported, and some government leaders who spoke to her were on her side. Liberal Party leader Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, for example, used the phrase, quote, methods of barbarism to describe the things that Hobhouse had told him. Now, that term became pretty tightly connected to Britain's actions during this war. The British government tasked Millicent Fawcett with leading a commission of women to go to South Africa and investigate. Although Fawcett was a suffragist and a campaigner for women's rights, she generally supported the government and the war, so she was seen as more moderate than Emily Hobhouse and kind of a better choice from the government's perspective of somebody to send down there. 
The Fawcett Commission confirmed a lot of what Hobhouse had reported about things like a lack of food and clean water, and it made a lot of recommendations for things like providing more fuel and more food, and including having more fruits and vegetables available, things like that. Like Hobhouse, the Fawcett Commission did not visit or investigate the camps for Black people at all. And when Hobhouse realized this, she once again tried to find someone else to do it. But it does not appear that effort was successful. Emily Hobhouse tried to return to the Boer camps in the fall of 1901. She knew that British authorities were keeping an eye on her and would not approve of this trip, so she kept her travel plans a secret, but word got out while she was on the way to South Africa. When her ship got to Cape Town, authorities refused to let her disembark until another ship was ready to depart for England. Then she was restrained with her own shawl and physically carried from one ship to the other. Her response to the soldiers who forcibly removed her was this, quote, You are disgracing your uniforms by obeying such an order. A higher law forbids you. The laws of God and humanity forbid you. At this point, in addition to the heart condition that we mentioned earlier, Hobhouse was experiencing back pain and neuritis. She'd also fallen and injured her hip on the voyage to South Africa, so this is all physically very difficult. The ship that she was sent back to Britain on was a troop transport, and the only other women on board were officers' wives who all refused to speak to her. The voyage took more than 20 days in each direction, and this time it was 48 days total, and she had no way to wash her clothes that entire time. Her family also didn't know what had happened to her. A friend in Cape Town sent a coded telegram to her relatives, which her brother Leonard eventually decoded to learn that she had been deported. Lord Alfred Milner, High Commissioner for South Africa and Governor of the Cape Colony, took over administration of the camps in November of 1901. On December 15th, Lord Kitchener issued an order that women and children not be transported to the camps anymore. Together with the Fawcett Commission's changes, this seems to have reduced the death rate at the camps, at least in the camps for Boers. The Boers surrendered in late May of 1902, and the war officially ended with the Treaty of Ferenging on May 31st of that year. The two Boer republics were placed under British authority, but they did retain a lot of autonomy. This is where we're ending this episode, and we will talk about Emily Hobhouse's life after the war next time. This is kind of a logical stopping point, especially because that part of her work is the thing that most people, like, that's the thing that she's become more associated with, but she had a whole, whole other part of her work that's going to follow. Do you have listener mail for us? This is from Teddy. I do. Teddy has titled this email, I Went to a Shaker School. And Teddy wrote, Hi, Tracy and Holly. I wanted to write in after the episode on Rebecca Cox Jackson because I have a close history with the Shakers. I went to the high school that's currently occupying three of the families, that's building groups, of the Mount Lebanon Shaker Village. When the Lebanon Shakers were low on numbers, they started a boys' school that's still continuing today. I went to class in rooms that used to be Shaker workshops and homes, and I especially love the Meeting House building, which is now the school's library. I'll never forget the words to Simple Gifts, and I remember all sorts of morbid rumors about them. Some real, like one building was used as a morgue and body storage if a brother or sister died in the winter and the ground was too frozen to dig a grave, and probably some not true like that a building was haunted by the ghosts of a baby secretly born to a shaker sister and hidden in the walls. Thank you for educating me about Rebecca and her mission. I've always been fascinated by the visions and gifts that shakers experienced and how they influenced the leadership of the group. Their access to the divine was much more egalitarian than in other contemporary groups. Gifts could come to any person regardless of gender, age, or class come to appreciate their worldview a lot more than I would have predicted when I was first introduced as a ninth grader. I'm attaching some pictures of my kitty, Persephone, including <laughs> one of her extra toes. She's got 26 and a half. And her cousin, Earl Gray, sticking his tongue out. Thanks so much, Teddy. Thank you, Teddy, for this email. And also for the cat pictures. I also love cat pictures. So cute. Um, also, you know, having two cats with extra toes. I love the extra toes also. 
They're not extra. They're the perfect number. Yes. <laughs> um, Onyx in particular has a very large, perfect number of toes on each foot. <laughs> uh, her front paws in particular, uh, clipping the nails is always just a whole, a whole thing. Gotta set aside a month. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately, they're both really good about the, like that. We did start doing nail clipping like as soon as we got them, and they are both pretty good about it. So, anyway, Teddy, thank you for that email and the adorable pictures. If you'd like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. We're also on social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and wherever else you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 